Come in and meet a small group of people who will show you uh, their love, their interest. Come and see. Come and see. So I want us to, uh, I want us to look tonight for a few minutes at John's Gospel again. We read over this last week, but I want to I drill down a little more this week. John chapter 1, verse 35 to 39. If you don't have a Bible with you, don't have it in your Bible, I, I'm guessing probably most of the folks that come on Sunday nights have brought their Bible with them, but um, then it's on the screen for you, okay? Stand with me as I read this. this is, let's, let's, hear, let's hear the Lord. Last week we looked at this in the context of Jesus' first seven days of ministry. We're going to come in a little closer tonight, a little closer focus, and look at this exchange that he has. Verse 35, the next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. He looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? That's a fair question. We'll come back to that. They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you'll see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Again, what have we read? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. I don't want us ever to forget that. That's why we say it every Sunday. It's not, it's not magical. There's not, it's not a rabbit's foot. It's a reminder that what we handle here are not uh, subtle suggestions for saints and sinners. It's the Word of God spoken to us, and we do well to hear it to take its commands and obey them, to take its precepts and embrace them, to take its examples and follow them. Thank you. Be seated. When you, when you see this encounter again, there's a, a vital principle of discipleship that comes up in the midst of Jesus encountering them. And it's this. Do not recruit people for anything without first allowing them to have their curiosity assuaged. You see, if we're going to be good disciple makers, then we've got to recognize some of the simplicity of it and, and not shy away thinking it's too complex for me, it's too, too high, too lofty, it's not. We've also got to recognize though as we encounter people, we don't need to be hesitant to ask questions and then encourage their questions when they have them. Our role is to nurture a heart hunger and to answer their mental curiosities. You see this exchange here. One writer said, uh, this wasn't original to me, they said, Jesus was not afraid to reveal the small print in the contract. We get the distinct impression from this passage that Jesus desired to make it easy to say no. We need to allow for that as an answer. Come. Come go to church with me. No, I don't want to. Well, if you ever do, the invitation is open. Rather than acting like we're offended that they would say no to us. Or we, or we think, well, you, you're a pretty carnal person if you don't want to go. To, no, no, we don't do that. Just extend. Just extend. Because you see, what will happen over time, if, we, if, we, if God gives us time, what will happen is you can establish a benchmark with people. Maybe people you see all the time. Maybe it's folks you see seldom. But you establish a benchmark. You've, you've invited them into your world. And here's what my observation has been. And if you hang around places long enough, you get to see this. Some of the very people, when I was engaged at First Baptist Clinton, Louisiana, in, in what I've told you was very intense reformation. And I don't tell you the story because Karen says, please don't tell that story again. And, and I want to honor that request. But it was intense, believe me. She didn't want to hear it again because it was too painful <laughs> to live through. Some of the same people 
and I'm listening to me, some of the same people who cursed me to my face ultimately came knocking on my door asking for help. You know why? I just tried to show them where north on the compass was. And when their life began to spin out of control, you know what they needed? They needed north on the compass. They needed to know what, what's, the, what's the fixed, unchangeable, non-negotiables. And I saw that happen over and over again. It was amazing. We do not know. You, you don't know what a person is going through, what they've been going through, when you simply approach them or happen to engage them in the, in the journey and bring up the subject of how you would love to have them come to church with you. Love to have you come to my Bible study group. We have, we have a great group of men. We study the Word. We have a wonderful group of women. I mean, folks, the proof is in the pudding. If we can get a, a, new, a new lady into a, our ladies' Bible study group, I think Dorothy was a shining example of that. She fell in love with a group of women that she did not know previously. Let's don't miss that opportunity. Let's not, let's not despise the simplicity of it. We just demonstrated a while ago that every one of us have the capacity within us to say, come and see. It's, it's there. Not hard to say. What we have to demonstrate next, I think, is the, is the confidence and belief that something that simple could be used by God. Because I told you last week, there's a statistic and I, that Ed Stetzer has put out, and Ed and Tom Rainer, I, I, trust, their, I trust their statistics. They're, they're good, godly men, and they don't... I, I took a course in college called Statistics, and one of the textbooks we read was How to Lie with Statistics. Well, they're not, they're not that crowd. They tell the truth. And one of the statistics is that a majority of people, I forget the percentage rate, but it's a high percentage rate of people, when asked, people who are not church going, when asked, why do you not go to church? Number one answer, no one has ever invited me. No one has ever taken the first step that Jesus commends here to say, come and see. Come and see. So, we need, to, we need to learn to be patient. You know, we're, we're kind of a McDonald's generation. We want to drive in, get it, and go. And that doesn't work in this arena. It's little by little. It's the invitation, come and see. They, they say they will, and they don't. Don't be discouraged. Don't think, well, they lied to me. Don't See, that's the devil trying to get into us to, to build a bridge, uh, build, a, build a, a wall between what we should do and what we feel like doing. Someone tells you no. Don't be discouraged. You have an opportunity to, to as you encounter them, if it's continual encounters, to love them, to show them what a difference this place you want to invite them into makes in your life. And when the day comes that they have a need for something dependable, you can count on it. They'll come to seek you out. Some of you have already experienced this. So I'm not telling you anything new. Jesus was basically saying to these two disciples, come with me and you can see how I live. You see, we need to invite people into our lives. Uh, life on life. We need to get close enough to them that we, that we learn about them. Now Jesus had perfect uh, capacity in his omniscience to know the, into the deepest secrets and heart of a person. We don't have that. You know what we do have though that the Lord's given us? is two listening ears. Have you ever noticed with some people, when you engage them, if you just ask a couple of questions, you don't need to say another thing? You ever notice that about some people? I see, we can go one of two ways there. We can think, that person's so full of himself, so full of herself, didn't hardly let me speak. We, we can do that. Or we can think, wow, that person needed to talk. 
you know who one of the best is that I know about? The, at this, there's several, but there's one of the best I know is my wife, Karen. She is the best I know at asking questions and then, and the right question, and things just begin to come out. And you listen, and you hear. If you listen long enough, you'll hear their heart. When they start sharing their heart, uh, they've let you in. And you can reciprocate by saying, come see how I live. Come walk with me. It's, it's so obviously simple that it's easy to despise. When we watch Jesus interact in these early, early passages, we learn quickly that we dare not lean on our own conventional wisdom. Can you imagine a group of early believers sitting around talking, when they, what maybe they heard about Stephen being stoned to death and that Saul of Tarsus was the one who basically organized the stoning and then gave, uh, gave the permission of the Sanhedrin to carry it out. What would a conversation have sounded like if they'd been sitting in a group talking about Saul of Tarsus? Do you think there was anybody in the group who would have said, you know, that guy has got so much zeal, he could probably write half the New Testament one day. I don't think anybody was saying that. You think they were saying, man, if that would be channeled for the grace of God, think of the good he could do. I don't, I don't think they were saying, I think they were saying, this is a bad fellow. I mean, you have to feel for the, for the fellow in Acts when, when he's told, you need to go. Uh, I've got Saul of Tarsus waiting to talk to you. He's blind. He can't see anything. You're going to have to lead him. Can you imagine what that fellow felt like? Well, at least he's blind. But you know, we never know. And here's one of the things that I, that I challenge myself about and I want to challenge you with. <clears throat> you know, the old saying is, don't judge a book by its cover. Never underestimate what the grace of God can do in a person's life. There's some folks that have been written off. Been written off because of their lifestyle, because of a reputation they have, of being coarse, of being, being rude, obnoxious, vile. Never underestimate what the grace of God can do to transform a person's life. There's some interesting stories available. There's a, uh, a Rose, Rosario, Rosario Butterfield, I think is her name. She was a college professor, a, a uh, militant lesbian, made fun of Christians. This, by her own testimony, despised Christians because she saw them as people who were trying to trample on her pleasures. She was in an unusual way befriended by a pastor who was simply kind to her. He invited her. He said, why don't you come to church? Oh, I'm not coming to church. I wouldn't be accepted there. You might be surprised. Why don't you come to church? And she tells about how as they would encounter one another, he would just reach out to her, continue to be kind. And one Sunday she pulled up, parked on the other side of the street, and sat looking at the church building. Couldn't bring herself to go in. Told him about it later on when they encountered one another. So he invited her to a dinner. Said, why don't you come, come eat with my family? She finally accepted the invitation to come and eat with the family. Said she had never seen love like that in her life. They didn't have horns. They didn't have fangs. They weren't there to, to roast her. They had welcomed her in as a guest and showed her kindness and love and compassion. You know what her story is, and you need to, you need to read it. It's, it's, just, it's precious, but her story is that the Lord used this to woo her to Himself. She broke off with her relationship. Uh, she is now uh, a vocal spokesperson for, uh, for God's way of relationships. She's married, uh, has a wonderful marriage. She is hated by the LGBT community as someone who's betrayed them. Uh, she gets threatened all the time. But how did that start? 
How did it start? With the kind encounter of a pastor who said, why don't you come to church? She did start going to church, by the way. The Lord saved her. She was baptized. And she has a wonderful story. And you see story over, over and over again. There's another story. I won't, I won't develop the details of it, but just really a snapshot of a, of a young woman who was in the, uh, in the uh, X-rated movie business. One of their starlets. And she encountered a believer. There's a, there's a group out there. I don't know if you've read about them. not called Triple X Church. They're, they're a cutting-edge group, but they, they, go, they minister to porn stars. And they showed love to her when she wasn't feeling any love and beginning to come face to face with her own lifestyle. And the Lord saved her and brought her out of that and she's now being helped to establish uh, a life that more reflects the glory of God. Over and over. Now I'm going to tell you something, folks. If we went down a list of people and, and saw flaming lesbian professor porn starlet we would not typically say I'll go after that one I think, I think there's a lot of promise there we wouldn't do it would we never never underestimate in a person's life what the grace of God can do to transform their lives so we don't depend on our own conventional wisdom we seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's so critical that the Lord lead us. See, see maybe, maybe we didn't take this exercise and impl implement it this past week because we didn't add the factor of you need to pray and ask the Lord to lead you to somebody that you can invite. Maybe we were going out of here saying, well, okay, if it happens, it happens. Or I'll, I'll do this. I'm, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to do this or bust what. No, we don't want to do this in our own strength. We do this in the power of the Spirit. You know something? I really believe if we were to pray, Lord, lay some soul upon my heart. We have a hymn of that effect. But the hymn tune is so, uh, so difficult that I couldn't figure out how to sing it. And I wasn't going to put it on you. I want us to read this, though. The title of it is, Lord, Lay Some Soul for My Heart. Number 570. I even looked for matching hymn tunes to see if there was a hymn tune we could sing it to. It would make it easier to sing. But just look at this in your hymnal as I read this. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. And may I bravely do my part to win that soul for Thee. Some soul for Thee. Some soul for Thee. This is my earnest plea. Help me each day on life's highway to win some soul for Thee. Lord, lead me to some soul in sin and grant that I may be imbued with power and love to win that soul, dear Lord, for Thee. Some soul for Thee, some soul for Thee. This is my earnest plea. Help me each day on life's highway to win some soul for Thee. To win that soul for Thee alone will be my constant prayer that when I've reached my heavenly home, I'll meet that dear one there. Some soul for thee, some soul for thee. This is my earnest plea. Help me each day on life's highway to win some soul for thee. Perhaps we approached this last week in a, in a very too rudimentary of a way. Something easy to do, but not wise to do if undertaken without that kind of a prayerful heart. And I want, us, I want us to commit to one another that, that that's the kind of prayer we'll pray this week. We'll do that before we leave tonight. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart. You know, I invited one of my neighbors to come. 
he's not here, so I need to, uh, need to, to go back again in a kind way. We've got to move beyond the, uh, we want instant. We want, to, we want to throw water on something and instantly grow. Instant. Jesus' teaching of his disciples was not something instant. I want, to, I want you to hear from E.M. Bounds. Are you familiar with E.M. Bounds? He's, he was, when he was alive, was, was famous for his books on prayer. One of the most powerful prayer warriors around. Listen to what he says. He says, we are constantly on a stretch, if not on a strain, to devise new methods, new plans, new organizations <clears throat> to advance the church and secure enlargement and efficiency for the gospel. This trend of the day, now Ian Bounds lived a pretty good time ago. He didn't just die recently. The trend of the day has a tendency to lose sight of the man or sink the man in the plan or organization. God's plan is to make much of the man, far more of him than of anything else. Men are God's method. The church is looking for better methods. God is looking for better men. You see, what we're doing here on Sunday evenings with God as my witness, this is not a program. This is a heart-to-heart -heart challenge one to another to learn from Jesus and then to take that and simply act like Jesus at the various levels that he calls us to. The suggestion has been made that, that every Christian needs to take time to select one or two people determined to spend time with them. The floor is wide open. It can be a time of Bible study, a time of prayer, a time of outreach, a time of, of various ministry engagement. With the emphasis on our modeling the example. And don't let the devil lie to you and say, well, your example is not is not a good one to follow. Brothers and sisters, don't let the devil, devil lie to you about that. That's just not true. We have in this room a sum of probably several hundred years of following Christ when we go around to you. You're still walking with the Lord through thick and through thin. People need to see that. They need to experience that. They need to know <clears throat> that we don't pretend to be perfect. Because we're not. We're forgiven. We're not know-it-alls. We're, we're, we're beggars who found the bread of life. And our hearts are touched when we see beggars who don't have the bread of life. And we want to share Him with them. But the first thing to do is invite them in. To invite them near us. Come and see how I live. And leave things wide open. We ought to be willing to walk with unconverted people. And willing to learn from them what they see when they look at us. Because if we cut them off, then all we do is continue to fulfill the caricature that they have of Christians. You see, here's what I think it gets down to for us. This is where we've got to do the gut check. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Paul the Apostle is writing to that, that church that had a lot of problems in it. And he says, as he's exhorting them to these different things, it's almost in passing. He says, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And I think there's a hesitance to embrace that. 
that we fear that, well, we won't, we won't reflect Christ the way he needs to be reflected. I reject that. Ephesians 2.10 tells us that if you are saved by grace through faith, now if you're not saved, that's a whole different conversation, but if you're saved by grace through faith, that you are his workmanship. And the, we've looked at this before when we went through Ephesians several years ago. That word is the, is the Greek word poema. You are his poem. This collection here tonight of people makes up an anthology of poems that tell about the grace of God shown to sinners in Jesus Christ. Your story is not my story, but we all have a story about Jesus Christ changing our lives. Don't sell yourself short, not because of who you are, but because of whose you are. You belong to a Savior who in His providence has us looking at this at this time and there's not a person sitting in here who knows Jesus Christ who is ill-equipped for the challenge. You are more than equipped. More than competent. We just bought into some lies. And we need to send those lies back to the pit of hell where they came. Come and see. Three words. Pretty easy. Now, before we wrap this up, do you notice how Jesus engaged them? Look at verse 38. He saw them following. What are you seeking? That's a fair question. Years ago, when I was going through the Reformation at First Baptist Clinton, we we did some things to, to adjust our constitution and bylaws to reflect the biblical teaching on corrective church discipline. And so we, what we did was we put a gate at the front door and a gate at the back door of the church, figuratively speaking, in terms of how we receive people into membership. Well, I was, uh, after that night that we walked and talked this through and took the vote as a congregation and voted to do it, I was accosted by a woman who simply unloaded on me that I was closing the doors of the church. And I said, tell me what you mean. And she said, her, she said I believe anyone at any time that they choose ought to be allowed to join a church. I said, anyone? Yes. Any time? Yes. Even black people? She went into a stutter step dance that was amazing to watch. I want to know why they want to join. I said, exactly. Me too. Except I apply it to people of all colors. Not just black people. I want to know why they want to join. What is it about this that appeals? What is it that they see that will be helpful to them? What is it that they see that they can contribute to? Jesus said, what are you seeking? Good questions sometimes open up a conversation. How are you doing? Are you involved on a regular basis anywhere in a, in a church or Bible study in our area? Now, something I have done before, and I, this, may, this, this may be something I need to repent of, so I'll just be honest with you, is if they tell me, yeah, we go to uh, such and such church. And I'll say, now, what's, what's the pastor's name there again? they can't tell me the pastor's name it's not like he's a low key fella he typically in front of folks enough that if you're there at all unless it's a funny name or a difficult name but ask questions and show them that 
you're willing to hear their questions and concerns. Open yourself to people who have caricatured you and me as Christians as being closed-minded, bigoted, we don't care, it's our way or the highway. You see, this doesn't require us to surrender one molecule of our convictions to do this. It simply means that we've got to be willing to humble ourselves and engage at a level that means we're a little vulnerable. Somebody might use us as the occasion they've been wanting to have for years to unleash on church. I'm here to stand and tell you people have done that to me before in years past. And it doesn't kill you. It doesn't kill you. Jesus asked questions and then he allowed questions to be asked. And he did not give them more than they needed. He did not go into hyperdrive to take those two on that day they spent with him and teach and teach and teach. He wanted them to see him. So here's my challenge before we talk a few minutes. Now the challenge from last week still stands. Commit as Christians who are committed, commit to find someone this week that you can say to them, why don't you come go to Sunday worship with me? Come go to the Bible study. Talk up your Bible study teacher. Man, our teacher's wonderful. It's always a rich time in Scripture. Great fellowship time. That commitment, with this caveat, in the spirit of this hymn we read, to pray, Lord, I want to do this. I want you to lay some soul upon my heart. And Lord, when I, when I, when I encounter that person, led by your spirit, help me to love that soul. You love them through me. Help me to listen. What's your story? I used to go to church. Well, they've told you a lot right there. Well, what's your story? What happened? And listen. And if we'll be good listeners, heart listeners, we will hear them tell us where they're hurting. And we can show them that we know how to love hurting people. And we happen to belong to a group of people who specialize in loving, hurting people. That's that challenge. The second one is, pray and ask the Lord to show you someone you can invite into your life, whether that means to invite into your home, to invite for coffee, to invite to spend a little time beyond the simple invitation, come and go to church with me. Jesus walks us along this path and it gets a little more uh, challenging. But really and truly, those two things shouldn't be awful challenging. I would imagine that we have here people who are wonderful in the gift of hospitality and simply show that kind of kindness. Show love and kindness to people that aren't expecting it from you. They may actually ask you, why do you act this way? And what a door they throw open then for you to say, well, I haven't always been this way. But I met the Master. And He showed me what love is. Show me how to love and show me how to be kind and tender-hearted and forgiving. That's why I am who I am. That's why I would extend this invitation, this kindness to you. Brothers and sisters, it's not, it's not complicated. It's not rocket scientists. It's, it's estimated that Jesus did this in his journey for around four months 
of simply saying, come and see. You, come, come see. And he assembled the twelve that way, but he also had a gathering of those beyond the twelve. And you, if you read through the gospel, with, let's put on the lenses of Jesus' hospitality and read through the gospels, you're going to see that he was, in his encounters, one of the kindest, most patient, tender men you've ever encountered, with one exception. And that's when he talked to the religious snobs. As patient as he was with the harlot, he was that much impatient with the Pharisees. As patient as he was with Nicodemus, he was that much impatient with the religious leaders who would come with their, their questions to trick him and to trap him and to try to expose him. And, and Jesus would have us to be tender too. Not wimpy, no. Jesus wasn't a wimp. Peter wasn't a wimp. And Paul was not a wimp. But oh, were they tender. Oh, were they kind. You will bump into people this week, whether you say anything to them or not, who are hurting because no one is kind to them. Their closest relationships are turmoil, friction. They are called awful things, told awful things, threatened. They work in places where people treat them like a, just a little above a dog. And you're not going to meet them this week. Let's we just lock ourselves inside and pull the shutters down and don't go outside. We're going to meet them this week. And I think even if we do that, probably somebody's going to come knocking on your door at some time during the week that has, this, has this, these things aching in their lives. Come and see. It's an invitation to be a part of you. It's an invitation to a place that promotes healing. Why don't you come have dinner with us? Why don't come go to lunch? Let's, let's go grab coffee. And see what the Lord will do with that kind of a uh, Jesus-like hospitality. I think we would be amazed if we will simply put this to the test for Him. He expected it of others because no sooner than he had modeled it those who were joining with him went out and modeled it so it wasn't something they had to have time to figure out same day they saw it they did it I want you and me to be increasingly like that we see Jesus engaged in his humanity and we say, God, being my helper, I will do that. I will say that. Let's sing a hymn before we have our...